who is an associate professor of geography and the Vermont State Climatologist. She's an applied climatologist by training with a Bachelor of Science in Physical Geography and Development Studies from the University of Toronto. She also has a Master's of Science in Climatology and Hydrology and a PhD in Climatology and Geographic Information Systems from McGill University. Leslie Ann's research interests intersect a number of interdisciplinary fields, including hydroclimatic natural hazards and climate literacy, as well as the use of remote sensing and GIS in the fields of spatial climate, excuse me, spatial climate and land surface processes. She's an expert in floods, droughts, and severe weather, and the ways in which these affect Vermont's landscape and people. She's the lead editor of Historical Climate, Variability, and Impacts in North America, which is the first monograph to deal with the use of documentary and other records for analyzing climate variability and change. Nationally, she serves on two NOAA science advisory board committees related to climate change across the U.S. She's also a contributing editor to Climate Change in the Northeast, a source book, which is for the Northeast Region chapter of the 2013 National Climate Assessment Report, part of the U.S. Global Climate Change Research Program. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Ann to the gun today. Thanks, Chris. I never realized how much of a mouthful that all is. <laughs> 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 okay, so thank you all for coming. Um, this, this is my second talk for the week, and I, I try to make sure I don't have the same slides and everything, just in case anybody was at my other talk. Was anybody at my other talk? No? Okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so when, when Deidre and I were emailing back and forth last semester and trying to a, come up with a date, and B, come up with a, a topic, um, we, we thought it might be fun to kind of um, have me do a, a retrospective on my time here at UVM, um, my role as a Vermont State Climatologist, and how that fits in with, with UVM's mission as being a, a land-grant institution. So that meant, of course, I had to go do some research on, on the land-grant piece and see how it kind of coincides. It's actually very nicely dovetailed with, with who I am um, as a faculty member here, and so it's a uh, work that I've been doing. So, um, be because I, I, I have this sort of dual role, um, a few years ago it, it made me sort of realize that I need to define who I am and make sure that that context is out there. So now when I introduce myself, I always say first and foremost, I'm a faculty member here at UVM um, in the geography department. I've been here since 1997. Um, and my area of expertise, as, as Chris mentioned, was, was the whole uh, land surface processes and how the atmosphere interacts with the landscape and, and vice versa. And how do you understand that over time and how does that then play into the policy and decision making and, and so forth. So it kind of fits really, really nicely with these two hats that I have to wear. So, so the other thing that I like to do is to kind of um, set the context with the various pieces of what I also do and I'm not teaching and I'm not responding to, to questions that come in from either K through 12 audiences or from um, speaking engagements and so on. And so um, I also serve on a number of different uh, national committees, including the um, I'm on the, uh, the American Association of State Climatologists, the AASC. I was the secretary of that for a, a year, a few years ago. Um, I also serve as a national counselor for the American Association of, of Geographers. Um, I'm, I'm also on the Applied Climatology Committee for the American Meteorological Society and I'm beginning to, these are all big, lots and lots of multiples, hopefully I don't stumble all, mm -hmm. over all of them. And then for the NOAA Science Advisory Board, I'm on, on their um, climate working group, which actually sets climate policy for the entire agency, you know, NOAA is a parent agency for the National Weather Service. So this, this is big to be kind of invited to do this sort of stuff in recognition of the various um, audiences that I kind of interact with and the various experiences that I've had over the, um, over the course of the, the years. So how did I get to, to being where I am right now? A lot of it has to do with um, my research and teaching interest in weather and climate and the various pieces nationally that I've managed to, to serve on, um, including being the um, director of the climate specialty group for the AEG. And that allowed me to actually poll nationally and do a temperature check and see what do we know, what do we don't know, and how can we actually um, use that knowledge to kind of move forward. So I'll talk about that. Um, in a second, and that sort of allowed me to tap into other groups that are doing similar things, including the Climate Literacy Network, which is now called CLEAN, um, and 
uh, get invited to the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva back in 2009 and, and find out that the stuff that we're seeing here in Vermont is actually also being observed in places like Australia and Bahrain and so on. And so it kind of uh, allows you to see that there's, there's something going on at the sort of K through 12 level that then permeates up to, to the, the higher ed level and, and how do we address that and how we kind of work with that. So that's kind of like some of the overarching things behind here. So when I was director of the, the climate specialty group, there are two initiatives that I started. One of them was to kind of focus in on climate literacy and how do we work that and a couple um, publications sort of came out of that. But the other big piece was um, a lot of times early career scientists don't have a, a safe place to act as a sounding board. You can't ask your advisor. You can't go out and just post, you know, willy-nilly. And so what I wanted to do was to create this little um, haven where atmospheric scientists and climatologists kind of coming up through the ranks could have that little place to, to get mentoring advice and ask questions that you may think is not being so bright, but there's no such thing as a dumb question anyway, right? So, so that was the second piece, which is the, the climate um, mentoring network that I started. And that all sort of fed into a national um, climate literacy document, which is now informing a lot of the next generation of state science standards in terms of bringing climate, climate change information into the, um, the curriculum at the K-12 level. Um, so how does this all fit in to UVM and UVM's mission as a, a land-grant institution? Well, you, you may all remember how all of this sort of started back with the, um, the Morrill Acts of 1862 and, and 1866 with um, Senator Justin Morrill, who um, was a Vermont senator, uh, one of the longest serving senators who actually um, introduced this bill and out of it uh, came the creation of the land grant um, thinking land grant college system and there are a couple additional acts uh, including the Hatch Act of 1887 and the, the Smith Lever Act of, of 1914 that then brought in additional pieces like the extension component, the agriculture component and a lot of this is actually sort of very well summarized by President um, John Bramley in his thinking about um, you know, the, the anniversary that we celebrated last year of, of the whole foundation of all of this. So a lot of this text I actually um, borrowed from, from then President Bramley's um, thinking about it, including what he sees as the 21st century mission of what a, a, a public land grant uh, university or college looks like in terms of that access to, to public education, um, applied research that then is in, in service to the um, state in which it happens to be found, and the <coughs> always dissemination of the information that has been gained um, within the, the, the halls of, of the university in question. So again, these uh, bullet points that you're seeing here directly out of um, President Bramley's thinking about what a modern land grant institution looks like. So kind of keep <coughs> excuse me, some of those terms in mind because when you look at what um, we as um, state climatologists are expected to do, you're going to see very, very similar words in, 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 in that communication of your capabilities in terms of uh, providing information services to the state, the research that is of need to the state that you are compelled to do, um, providing different types of outreach, either in terms of projects or um, presentations, and then uh, different types of assessment and, and impact um, monitoring types of activities that we're, we're allowed to do. So when you look at this map across in here, you'll, you'll notice, and I may have to come next to this touch screen here because my mouse isn't working, you'll notice that there's some states that are orange and some states that are brown. And Vermont is in orange, New Hampshire is in orange. What does that orange mean? It means that we are American Association of State Climatologists recognized state climate offices, or our schools, which means that we have a mandate to fulfill in terms of communication and outreach and research. And we have to get pr pretty much certified every year that we're con continuing to do this in a, in a way that meets the needs across the state. So the states that you see in orange across there are actually um, these are school states that, that, that meet and continue to meet these uh, various criteria. In the brown states, they just don't meet the criteria? The brown states required. are either, there's no state climatologist there, or they have um, submitted the paperwork that, that you need to, to achieve that. So.
There we go. All right. So most of, of my colleagues who are state climatologists um, self-identify as being applied climatologists. And what does that mean? This, this is one of those slides which I usually apologize for profusely because I should never do this. This is way too many words mm -hmm. all on the same slide. And essentially, if I were to kind of draw your eye to some of, of the, the, the pieces of what an applied climatologist does, it's science in the service of society. So you're working on research problems that were driven by a stakeholder. Okay, as opposed to a uh, statistical climatologist who works primarily with um, statistical averages and, and so on of, of climate, but it might be more theoretical. All right, or a, a microclimatologist who's working on a very small area, maybe the size of this room, and, and trying to figure out what the processes are. Most of, of the problems that we as, as applied climatologists work on, whether they are uh, weather sensitive types of decisions, but they're actually driven by somebody outside saying we need X. So like when the state says to me, um, would be good if you could ov ov overlook and, and have a, a C on the draft document that we're doing for our climate change impacts assessment, that's a, a great example of that. Okay. So it was fortunate um, that I was able to host the state climatologist meeting here in Burlington in 2008. Um, I had actually um, been waiting to do this ever since my first meeting in 1998, which was in Duluth, and I got there and they said, oh, somebody from Vermont, yay, can we come to Vermont? Yes, <laughs> do you have tenure? No, sit down. <laughs> so I had to sit back down until I got tenure and, and have all those pieces in place. Um, before I was able to stand back up and say, would you like to come to Vermont? Everybody wants to come to Vermont. And so what we usually do is take a snapshot of all of the state climatologists, which you see on the left. Not a bad representation for 50 states that have 36 folks in place. But I also wanted to show the breadth of the state climatologist organization, including our associate members, including the regional climate centers, um, and other folks who have this weather and climate interest. And those are the folks that you see across on the right-hand side. Now. Part of, of that meeting here in 2008 was working very, very closely with my colleagues at the National Weather Service. And if you don't know, take a look out the window that way. Adam's house right next door, 601 Main Street, used to be the uh, Weather Bureau building um, from 1906 up until the records moved to the, the airport. And it looks like every other weather bureau building across the entire U.S., perfectly square, flat roof, because it was designed to launch weather balloons from the top of that building. The families lived on the main floor. The upper floor was, de was devoted to where the records were, were kept, so they could just go outside, go up the stairs, and launch the balloons and so forth. And so in commemoration of that, we actually um, worked together to get a dedication plaque, which is what you see on the right-hand side across there. So, so when you go outside here today, I know you're just going to be burning with curiosity <laughs> to, to walk the six steps that you need to actually go and read that dedication. And because I do a lot of historical stuff, um, one of my colleagues got this postcard on eBay, and if you look really, really closely, you see the weather station right in the front there. This is from 1905. Okay. Um, so. Did you guys launch a balloon too? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Can we? laughs> Actually, no. So, so the building right now is a is a ROTC building. And it's, it's interesting because I was reading somewhere that all land grant institute, institutions have two things, a moral hall and a rot sea. <coughs> so this is, this is a nice kind of coming together of both the weather and the land grant and, and the, the military aspect. So to keep my sanity, I had to find a, a, a way of melding all of these various pieces of, of what I have to do as a state climatologist with my faculty um, commitment to research and teaching. And so all of this actually kind of fits together and I don't sort of separate them out, you know, that sort of 40-40-20 split that we tend to do as, as, as faculty members. And as Chris mentioned in her introduction, one of the, the, the things that I, I worked on um, and managed to put together in conjunction with um, my colleague Carrie Mock was uh, this book called Historical Climate Variability and Impacts in North America. And my chapter in it was looking at droughts in Vermont, um, sugar mapling in Vermont, and any other sort of bio, bioclimatic um, phenological types of impacts um, over time. And why did I kind of focus in on drought? 
Well, one of the things is that um, when you think about climate change and you think about some of the impacts that are projected for climate change, you, you, you hear about increased droughts and floods across the region. And I was hearing that we're going to have um, droughts like we've never seen before. So I wanted to see what droughts that had never been seen before look like in Vermont. And also to find a way of comparing those historical droughts with, with current droughts. And so I created this, um, this indicator-based way of, of looking at drought that was designed to merge with the numerical way that we use today. So you want to know what droughts that have never been seen before look like in Vermont? OK. Those are actually my category four and five in here. And when those have occurred in the 1700s and the 1800s, we're talking about the landscape drying out to the extent that wetlands start to burn and burn continuously for years at a time. Now, we all think of Vermont being um, green and wet and all that sort of stuff, but you, you, you can imagine what it would take for a, a, an existing dry period to last for long enough that it's not just your um, precipitation <coughs> falling, it's not just your lakes and streams drying up, but we're also talking about <coughs> ecosystems that are so dry that you have things like muck fires continuing to burn for extended periods of time. So my thinking was to, to meld it with something that we use currently, which is the drought monitor, which you may have seen on you know, like the National Weather Channel and other places. You know, when they talk about severe drought, and historic drought, and exceptional drought in the West, what they're essentially um, referencing is this, this drought monitor, which comes out every week. And so it categorizes the extent and impacts of, of drought um, in different places across the, the, um, the US. So, be, because I have this mandate to get the information out there, um, I do this in a, in a number of different ways, including um, some of these examples on here, like working with um, the, the, the EBSCO programming that, that we, we had um, a couple of years ago, Emerging Science, you may remember that, um, but, but also working with PBS specials and National Ge Geographic specials to, to bring some of that to the fore. So, I do a lot of talks. Um, and I try to get a, a snapshot of some of these talks from around the state. Um, some of them are from um, being on, on Peg TV in Rutland. Some of them are from OSHA community talks up in, in Springfield and, and Newport. Um, I, I was also fortunate to be um, offered, uh, invited to give a keynote at the Center for Research on Vermont um, back in 2010. And, Last October, I was invited to the, the NSF EBSCO National Conference to talk about some of the various perspectives um, that I've had um, over, the, over the years. So here are some of the, the, the audiences that I've, I've talked to um, over time. I'm going to leave the, the media for, for, for a little bit later because I have a couple comments to, to make on those. But you'll see that I, I work through uh, K through 16 plus um, students and, and teachers as well. Um, I do a lot of, of, of presentations to retired communities. Um, I work very, very closely with um, different state agencies, including Department of Health and um, Emergency Management and Homeland Security, um, VTRANS, and trying to get um, not just climate information like temperature and precipitation, but also things like um, how do you plan for hydrologic conditions in, in terms of new dams or um, different types of floods, storm water events, and so forth. So it's a question of, of trying to be as um, flexible as possible in terms of the audiences that I work with. So I absolutely love working with um, K through six and K through eight students. And these, these are some of the students that I've sort of worked with over the years. And, and one of the reasons is when, when you tap into a child's curiosity and you get them hooked on science, you get them hooked on, on climate, it's one of those things that sort of keeps them going and, and increases their curiosity. But it also helps to reduce a lot of, of angst because um, people ask me, don't you get depressed talking about climate and climate change? And, and a, a lot of it is um, how do you do it in such a way that it's developmentally appropriate and age appropriate and audience appropriate. And you know, there's, there's a lot of nature science discourse that, that talks about hooking um, kids when they're, they're young and, and, and having that kind of move on through because um, unfortunately when, when I see students in my class, my weather and climate and landscapes class, 
at zero level, sometimes that's the first time they're getting weather and climate stuff. And it's, it's unfortunate that it's, it's so late. Um, so, so my goal is to try and get that out a little bit sooner. So how do I do that? Well, one thing that I've done is I've created this um, professional development program for um, K through 12 educators who are science educators and math educators. It's called SWAC, um, Science Oh, sorry, Satellites, Weather and Climate, I should know my own program. <laughs> um, it's been going on since 2008 and it's, it's got a STEM focus to it, so we've got um, meteorologists, climatologists, um, engineers, um, um, technology um, specialists to try and bring together uh, teachers so that we can help to support what they're doing in their curriculum as opposed to having it be an add-on. So, you know, things that you, they may have wanted to do but didn't have either the resources or the, the personnel to kind of tap into. So, um, it's inquiry-based, it's project-based, and because we're here, it's also sort of place-based and allows um, your math teachers, <coughs> social science teachers, science teachers to actually acquire some of that um, content to help step on through. And another um, piece that I've, I've worked on to try and bring weather and climate information into the classrooms has a slightly different focus to it in, in that it's trying to get all students um, involved and it, I call that the Diversity Climate Network or DecLimeNet. I tried to come up with something that was hip and cool <laughs> for students. I asked them, does the climate sound cool? They go, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't succeed that well with that one. But I work with students both here in Burlington as well as in Manhattan, um, New York, and kind of piggybacking on a lot of the admissions programming that we have here at UVA. And again, sort of spread the word and get the, the network out. So um, this one is a collaboration with colleagues at um, University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, uh, uh, University of Georgia. And a lot of what we do um, is kind of driven by this scientist in the lower right across in here. His name's Dr. Warren Washington. He is a climate modeler who has been working on um, climate modeling since the 1960s. And he is the first African American to receive the Medal of Science from, um, from, from the US. And so he received that from President Obama back in 2011. So when I saw him, I was like, Warren, can we put a picture on, on your page? He goes, sure. So, so when you put that in there, like, everybody's, ooh, you got a picture of President Obama on there. So I show that to, to the students, and they go, and I say, this is who we look up to. And they usually say, President Obama? I go, him too. But then, then I say, okay, so then I can bring in you know, Warren's work and how does um, being hooked on, on science kind of fit into that. So then I can show pictures a little bit close up, and then they see the connection and ties. And, and, and how do you sort of move this through. Um, so at the University of Georgia, one of, of my colleagues is um, Marshall Shepard across in here, and he is currently the president of the American Meteorological Society. So it's kind of nice to, to allow people to see some of those ties that we have across the board. So when I give all these various talks, what I try to do is, is to make sure that I know who's in the audience so that I can use the appropriate examples um, so it makes sense to, to, to who I'm looking at. So um, if, if I'm giving an agricultural perspective talk, I may use some of these great shots that come out of special collections here at UVM. Um, when I give a stormwater talk or a hydro type talk, I might use some of these flooding shots that I took during the, the May floods of 2011, just before Irene came through. And then, you know, there, there's some points that um, are, are pretty much um, across the board. And the last one here, this is a, this is a slide that I had put together from, I, I would say, I don't know, 1998, 2000. And, you know, I, I used to joke about rice, you know, with all the increasing precipitation that we're, we have. I no longer joke about rice because rice thrives here in the state. Um, there, there are rice growers in the southern part of the state. They're actually upland growers. And so this is no longer a question mark. It's no longer tongue-in-cheek. It's actually a sort of adaptation to the amount of precipitation we're getting and how do we um, change our cropping patterns, styles, and, and choices to actually fit with a lot of that. Um, when I give talks, sometimes I use the same slides but tweak what I actually say. So, so for example, um, when we talk about something like Hurricane Irene and whether we've seen hurricanes in the past, what can we learn from them, 
uh, but then they become more frequent and that sort of stuff. There, there's some great um, resources that show you these hurricane tracks over time. So, so here's Vermont, across and in here, and you're seeing some of those tracks. And when, when, when you kind of focus in on central Vermont, because I was giving a talk to the, the Metropolitan Planning Commission there, um, you can see where some of these tracks have been over time, including where Irene is, and you're seeing some of that overlapping um, tracking pattern across in here. Um, some of it recent, some of it not so recent. Okay? And using that same sort of, of thinking, talking with the, the students that I work with in Manhattan, and mm -hmm. saying to them, um, do you think New York's vulnerable to hurricanes? And these are uh, sort of grade 11 and, and 10 and 12 students, and you know, not exposed to having a lot of hurricanes. They go, nah, not really. And then you show them something like this, and then you kind of zoom in a little bit, and you can see the sort of crisscross across um, Long Island, and they go, oh, so, so Sandy wasn't you know, the first of its kind in sand, and Sandy's track wasn't so out of the ordinary. So giving them that sort of idea that, you know, um, historical perspective is important to actually understand and look at that, in addition to understanding the processes and the dynamics as well. So, um, a couple of years ago I was invited to, to, to participate in um, an expert witness training academy that was held um, across of Minnesota. And this was, this was interesting because has anybody ever had to give testimony in court? You, all right. In Congress. In Congress? How was that? I, was, I didn't sleep the night before. You didn't? <laughs> and it wasn't just cramming, was it? No. <laughs> did, you have any, did you have any training before that? Not at all. Yeah. So, so this was like throwing you in cold. Right. And so this, this was actually really, really helpful to me because it, it allowed you to, to actually work <coughs> with um, a number of practicing and retired judges on the bench who showed you what you should and should not say and how you should answer questions, how you should reframe questions, when to say, I'm sorry, this is outside of my area of expertise and leave it at that. Don't go babbling, don't go waffling. <laughs> That's when you get into trouble if you don't know it. Zip it, you know, all those types of things that are critical when you call upon to give testimony. And so, you know, something like that would have been, you know, at least give you three hours of sleep, as opposed to no hours of sleep, right? So, so it, 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 was, it, was, it was interesting because then I, I then was able to use that when, when I worked with some lawyers um, last year. So, having some of these experiences are really, really great. So, um, I had to think about uh, my interaction with the media and, and kind of put it into categories across and in here. And you know, so I, I put this into some of the Vermont um, interviews that I've done, some of the regional interviews, some of the national interviews, and some of the international interviews. And it's kind of, of interesting to think back on how do you prep for some of those, how many slides do you have to think about, what the key messages, you know, they always tell you come up with three big points that you kind of hit home and make sure they've, they've heard them and, and make sure that, you know, that you're being clear and articulate in terms of getting some of those across. And so it's, it's been really um, interesting to, to, to work through some of that and, and how do you respond to questions in a way that makes sense. Um, so when, when, when I think about uh, Getting that message across, what are some of the things that are non-negotiable for me? Well, one of the things that I always try to get across is understanding when in, in the year um, either precipitation is falling, um, when from a time perspective, is it daily, is it hourly, is it seasonal? Because that makes a difference to the specific audience in question that I'm looking at. And if you look at this from a, an annual perspective, um, this is looking at the Northeast Kingdom only, so the, um, the, the upper part of the state, which is very different from where we are in the Champlain Valley. So if you look at it from an annual perspective, you see, of course, that extended drought period that we had in the 60s, and you see the increased precipitation across in here. So you get one picture, right? If you look at it from two different months in the year, so something like um, a, a, a sort of springtime event, you get a very, very different picture in terms of if springs are continuing to be dry or wet, or if their peers are sort of alternate in between, versus what's going on in the summer, okay, in August. So timing is, is always critical, especially if you're dealing with anything that's water-based. So that's, that's one thing I kind of try and pick up. 
when you do this seasonally, you also get a, a slightly different understanding for how things are shaking out. So I've got um, December, January, February, so winter in here, and that sort of slight drying that we're seeing over time from 1895 to present. Uh, you've got March, April, May, or spring across in there, and you're also seeing some, some total drying. Um, June, July, August, which is your summer, and your September, October, November, which is your fall. And you see that a lot of the precipitation <coughs> increases are in the fall. So that when I show this, and I, I ask, because I like, like to do a lot of interactive um, types of, of talks, and I say, does this make a difference to you knowing when the timing is? And when I, when I, when I show this talk at NOFA um, audience last year, they said, yes, it does. Because knowing that you're getting more precipitation in the fall is then going to influence their decisions on when to crop and what type of, of crops to choose. So, so that sort of timing thing, I guess, is not, and it's not anything to sneeze at um, from a from is that Vermont-wide or one station in Vermont? This, this one is Vermont-wide. So it's an average for, for, for Vermont? It is. Okay. <coughs> so again, if you were to do this from a region-wide, season-wide, you get a slightly different perspective. Yeah. yeah. Which is important, right? Mm -hmm. so, so time is important, location is also important. Um, so Vermont has three um, groupings that we put it in. The Northeast Kingdom is one. The Champlain Valley is another one, and the southeast is a third one. And the southeast actually looks more like Massachusetts than it does the rest of Vermont, right? So automatically, you're going to start thinking, if they look more like Massachusetts, when you start saying statewide, it becomes less of a, of a something that makes sense, okay? So the southeast, which looks more like um, Massachusetts, tends to be a whole lot drier than the rest of the state does. So it's, it's decoupled from, from the rest of the state in terms of the precipitation that we receive. And a lot of that has to do with your, where your storm tracks actually move, right? So in a year like this year, where you know we tended to get a lot of storms moving south of us, and then some came north, that's then going to influence um, where that kind of shakes out. The Northeast Kingdom up in here, and of course, Champlain Valley across in there. So again, location is also critically important. And when you put it all together in terms of the state, that's on the upper right across in here. All of that's going to be mixed together. Okay, so location, 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 critically important. Um, you probably noticed by now that my way of, of talking is, is an interpretive type style. So I kind of break things apart for you and then put it all back together. So in my classes where I do this, everybody does this. And they all go out and they think they understand it. And then comes the homework and they're like this. Because they got it in class, but then when you have to sit and make it your own, that's when the rubber meets the road. So I use that when I, give, I go out and I give talks. So here's a classic example of Hurricane Sandy. Okay? And you've got the infrared information on, on the left. You may have seen these on weather, weather re reports at night. Have you seen some of these? Okay. And on the left-hand side, you've got the jet stream flow. So the darker the color, the drier the atmosphere, the whiter the color, the more moisture in the atmosphere. And you can see Sandy sticking up like this, right, on both of them. So you've got their Sandy sticking up like this, their Sandy sticking up like that on both of them, okay? So when, when, when we, you, you think about um, hurricanes in general, be it Irene, be it Sandy, doesn't matter. All of them are energy machines that pick up the energy from, from the, the warm water that they pass over and then cycle it through and it falls out as rain. So of course, as soon as they make landfall and you don't have that energy source anymore, they start to die off, right? So when you look at this, you kind of see the darker the color in here, where places are more likely to have hurricanes form and thrive because of that, that energy source, okay? So when, when you think about that and you apply it to something like Hurricane Sandy, what we're looking at is how warm the sea surface temperatures were just as Hurricane Sandy was, was about to hit. So let me get you situated. Here's Florida, here's the eastern seaboard, and the redder the color, the warmer the water. You see how warm the water was just off the coast of, of Sandy, right? And Is that the jet stream? I'm sorry, the Gulf Stream? So it's, it's part of the Gulf Stream, but it's, it's also um, showing you the entire um, North Atlantic. So the Gulf Stream comes up like this, and continues off across in here. I was so just this, wondering this if that red is a there. product of the, of the Gulf Stream. Um, I don't know if it was a product of or, okay. or in addition to. Okay. 
So that, that's one of those pieces that you know, people who are hurricane experts are actually like, actively focusing on. You know why? Because all you need is this much of warm water right. to have a hurricane intensify. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Hurricane Katrina went from being a cat one to a cat three simply because she passed over this much worth of, of warm water just before she hit New Orleans. So, so the depth of that and the warmness of it is, is again, nothing to sort of to brush aside. What's the warmth in that case, double T versus the layer underneath? So in this case here, in, in Sandy, we're talking about as much as eight degrees uh, of, of, warm, of warm water that we're looking at. I don't know how deep it was, but it's, it's the, the um, actual amount that's shown <laughs> on this graph, not the depth. And this is an anomaly, right? So it's it warmer is. by eight degrees even than the Gulf Stream. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's what the average is yeah. over whatever the time frame. Yeah. Could be 30 years, could be 100 years. And then it's eight degrees warmer than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you think about that, that then translates into that additional amount of energy that was available. So zooming in a little bit, um, these are some buoys off the coast of... Um, uh, New Jersey that they have a network that runs in there and you've got the scale across in here in terms of how warm the, the ocean was so it goes up to over 28 degrees on that side and that corresponds to where that blur was across in here okay so this is from the 26th <coughs> of October just before Sandy hit this is right after Sandy okay and when I show that to the 10th and 11th graders and I say to them what just happened? They said, Sandy just took all the energy out. Okay? So whether they are earth science majors, biology majors, or whatever, if you walk them through with enough information, they can then turn around and make that deduction for you. And, and that, that's what an interpretive style does. What does white mean? White means that there's either no information, like the, the, the buoys went out, Lots or they did buoys after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I mean, so one conclusion is that Hurricane Sandy broke buoys, not that it sucked out the energy. And well, it, it, the it, su it sucked out the energy here, because look at the difference between the warmth and, and that coldness. I mean, you've gone from 28 degrees down to 7 degrees in some cases. That is huge. And that energy has to have gone somewhere. It's unfortunate that this is missing, missing data. That white piece in there. But what we can see, we can see that the temperature went down. Hugely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would sure. you do, do that flash again? Three days. Yeah. Three days. So, so this is the before, 26th, and this is the after, 29th. Yeah. I won't forget it. Huh? I won't forget it. You don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I need to kind of speed up a little bit here. I'm having way too much fun showing you all this stuff. So what are some of the challenges to spreading the word? Um, I thought about this and I put together an article um, that came out back in 2010 and essentially there are about six challenges. I can forward you this article, just shoot me an email that says in the subject line, um, communication challenges and I'll shoot you back the, the paper, okay? So don't bother to try and, and copy down all of this stuff here. It looks at some of the, the, the basic things that I've, I've sort of encountered over the last um, 17 years in terms of where we still need to have work done. And one of them has to do with um, different styles of learning and how that sort of shakes out. You know, whether you're an, an active experimenter or whether you um, need to do hands-on or uh, talk things through or um, put everything together abstractly. Those are some of the, the ways that um, we can think about our, our learning style because it has implications for how do we then interact with the material. <coughs> so how, does, how do I work with this? Do you, look, do you see this diagram here? Does this make sense to you? It's a cartoon showing you um, the processes in the atmosphere of how a global climate model would um, operate with greenhouse gas effect, um, the interaction between the, the, the ocean and the atmosphere, what takes place on land with land use and so on. This is this is diagram understandable, okay? This one's probably even better because it shows you a 3D perspective and now you can see what the landscape is doing a little bit better than this previous one here, okay? The one that probably is not going to work for you is this one. <laughs> and why is that? It's because there's 
a lot of information going on in here that you don't have the background to, to understand necessarily, and so this type of diagram does not work well in a public setting. It may work well in an academic setting, but not in a public speaking setting. Okay? So that's what I mean by using some of that to, to understand the, 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 the challenges. Um, because I, I, I work with um, K through gray um, <laughs> population, um, I know it's, this, is, this, is, this is the actual term, K through gray, um, all the way to lifelong learners, um, it allows me to actually see where people get their information from because then that in allows me to inform what I say. And so I, I asked this question uh, back in 2008, where are you getting your information from? And you'll notice that the, the students get a lot of their information from class, they get a lot of their information from TV and so forth. But if I ask that same question of our staff, um, the picture changes because our staff are in their, um, uh, I would say, late 20s, all the way up to 50s, 60s, and so um, the role of class information drops out of the picture completely, okay? And then when I switch this with our lifelong learners, the picture changes yet again because now we have um, the, the additional input of not just television news, but newspapers and radio and, and going directly to NOAA.gov, okay? Which, which you don't always see in students. Um, so again, Knowing that and knowing how to, to, to shape things is, is, is critically important. So some of the things that I've learned over time is not to overload, because I, I tend to do that. I tend to give a lot of information, sort of um, to need to step back a little bit. Make it accessible in a way that makes sense for the people that I'm talking to, and to use humor very, very cautiously. Um, I have a, a self-deprecating sense of humor, which um, sets people at ease. But at the same time, if I'm giving an interview, I've learned not to make a joke, because that's the comment that will show up in print, okay? <laughs> not the science, the, the offhand you know, joke. So I've learned not to, to kind of do that. Um, the other thing that I've learned is to, to use these teachable moments. So the word of the winter is polar vortex. And everybody's thinking, is this a brand new term? And if, if you Googled it on the 30th of December, you'd be like five hits. Google it on the 5th of January, 5,000 hits, <laughs> right? So you're wondering, is this a brand new term? Yeah, and, and it's actually not. And what, what, what I found is a lot of these um, things that have been in the atmospheric understanding and lexicon are now coming into the public lexicon. And so something like the polar vortex, which looks at the difference in pressure between the Arctic and the mid latitudes, and how that then changes the role of the jet stream, so that you have this on your right, which is the sort of classic case, versus the wobbly type of jet stream that we, we've been seeing for the last you know, two months. And you know, it's the evidence again, one more time, of the inches of snow that we have outside right now. How does that understanding make its way into our general understanding? So whenever I talk to, um, to, to the media, it's a great place for me to kind of bring some of that into the picture itself. So that's, that's a teachable Excuse moment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is the jet stream the white boundary? Uh, in this case How can here, we understand the jet stream in relation to that kind of map? How can we understand jet streams? So the jet stream really marks related to that. right. So so the in in the what, what we have here in the in terms of the positive phase is um, the, the low pressure system over the Arctic and higher pressure systems over here. So yes, so that boundary marks kind of like the the outer edge of where the cold, really cold air is and the warmer air. So right. the blue is really cold and here is is, is warmer. Got it. And so when you've got that. Um, really strong case where all this is, is concentrated over the poles, all the cold air stays towards the poles. Right. But when the, the pressure difference, instead of being very, very steep between the Arctic and mid-latitudes, when that pressure difference decreases like this, then the, the jet stream starts to get sluggish. Sure. And when it's sluggish, it meanders, you know, kind of like a, a river, when, when it doesn't have a lot of energy, sure. it meanders a whole lot, sure. as opposed to cutting straight through, right? Yeah. So what you're seeing across in here is when that pressure difference decreases, jet stream starts to meander, and so it dips further south, goes back further north, and so on across the globe. And, and, and that's the, the sort of um, 
net result that we see with so when we you look at a map like, vortex. We look at a map like this, we can't actually discern where the jet stream is. We just know that because of this uh, very scant gradient that it's probably wandering around a lot. Right. So, so you probably could use that white line that you, you were asking about to give you a sense of where the jet stream is because you're looking to see where things move further south. That, so that includes your pressure difference, but it also includes the cold air that goes along with it. Because the jet stream is simply the difference between cold air, that's pole what, and warm air, that's equator what. So whenever that, that line moves, the well, jet stream It's a heat moves. transfer system. It is. That's understood. So it's just a question of how does it work. So I don't want to take any more time on this. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, awesome. but that's a great question. Yeah. So um, that <clears throat> movement of the jet stream back and forth over time also occurs with things like your um, El Nino patterns. You've heard about El Nino, okay? And, and, and that in turn is going to influence further downstream from that. So it brings in this, this, this notion of, of um, variations and climate variability, how that feeds into climate change. So understanding how all of these pieces kind of go together is, is absolutely critical. So you, you probably realize by now that I had to bone up on a whole lot of other disciplines in order to be able to be articulate and make sense of, of all of these pieces that I've, I've had to talk about. So I'm a climatologist by training, but I've had to learn a little bit about geology. I've had to learn a little bit about cognitive sciences and how people learn and how people interact with material. Um, I've also had to learn about different parts of the agricultural system and so forth. And so when I think about that, it makes me think, um, am I a journal of all trades, a master of dot, dot, dot. Okay, I'm not going to fill that in. But it, it also allows me to, to think of myself as a portal. So if I don't know stuff, I go out and find somebody else who does. So that I can then be a sort of two-way street to a lot of that. But the, the thing that makes me stop and think that I had to for, for this presentation is, am I a public academic? Or am I a public servant? Or am I both? Okay? So I'm just going to leave that as a, a, a sort of... Um, or choice out there. Okay, so some of the things that I've learned over time are to sort of capitalize on um, local knowledge. Everything is a lot based, place based here in Vermont. And how do you work with that and how do you use that to address the different um, needs that you need to address? I know a lot of meteorologists, you know, like Tom Messner and Gib Brown and Sharon Meyer and, you know, all the folks who I'm going to insult because I didn't just mention them and this is going to appear on RETN, but it allows me to, to have entree into places that I wouldn't have otherwise and also to bring those folks into my class too. So there's that sort of piggybacking across in here. Um, I'm really serious about doing climate, uh, climate sciences at all levels because it's critically important. We're all going to need to learn this. And um, I absolutely um, are gung-ho about our, our teacher development in terms of, of getting that information out there. So let me end with um, the State Climatologist website. There's a URL across in here. Uh, please have a look if you have never been to, to this website. There's a lot of information on here in terms of finding data, both current data as well as past and historical data. Um, there, there's also a lot of links to the National Climatic Data Center for looking at different types of impacts. Um, if you want to do different types of rankings, all of those graphs that I showed all came from there. And I've left these links up, the Sandy link, the Irene link, um, and the Lake Champlain 2011 flooding link. So, you know, uh, hazards like that are not going to go away. There's no need to sort of reinvent and put them back up when they do. So those are all up there. So with that, I'd like to close um, and ask for any questions if you do have them. Okay. Take a look. So I have, that was really interesting, really good survey of the kind of stuff you do that helps a lot. I have like a question from like the first five minutes of your talk, no. something I missed. Okay. So, I mean, you're a professor at UVM, right? Mm -hmm. How did you become the state climatologist? I forgot to mention that. And is it related the way extension appointments are, or is it a totally different volunteer piece of service, or how do those two things actually work? Thank you for that question. So, the state climatologist program was actually a federal program in the 1940s, mm -hmm. and then um, it was axed. 
And then when Noah became Noah in the 70s, um, there was thinking of bringing it back. So the state climatologist organization was, was founded in 1978. But there's this at least 50 year history of having state climatologist functions. Um, here at UVM, it's a, a memorandum of understanding between the provost office and the National Climatic Data Center. So the, the person who is a climatologist in the geography department is uh, designated as being a state climatologist. Is it always in the UVM geography department? Yes. In Vermont? Mm -hmm. Is it always at the land grant university in it's every state? pretty much at a land grant institution because of that mission of outreach and, and service right. to the state, but not always. <clears throat> um, if it's not there, it's going to be at uh, a national resource agency, so uh, like uh, in South Carolina, it's at the Department of Natural Resources. Okay. In so Illinois, state, it's, it's, at, it's at the Water Survey. Right. Right. But most of the time, I would say 75% of us are land grant institutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I was supposed to have mentioned that. So at it's the beginning. part of your UVM job. And it is, always was and always will. Exactly. Okay. So it's part of my service, and you know, like I said, for sanity purposes, instead of having my service hat, yeah. my research hat, my teaching hat, they're all. Well, since you are, um, have some obligations or responsibilities to the state, and some of those older statements also, I think, say the same thing. There's, there's a, an idea here that you are responsible for helping people make money, helping the state grow economically. So I guess my question would be, uh, to what extent do you have to fight fires with farmers or others who come in and demand action? I, I, I don't, actually. I, I've never had requests along those lines. It's, most of my requests have either been um, directly working with state agencies in terms of planning that's going on, or directly working with individuals who either had a flooded basement and needed to have um, records to prove that precipitation fell, and that's why the basement flooded. But I, I haven't had um, any questions that deal with uh, monetary issues, like what you just asked about. Well, I, I put it in rather bold terms. I mean, if farmers want to be able to farm, right? And uh, I mean, I could put it that way and not mention money. But mm -hmm. Same idea. Uh, to what extent are they, well, other agencies or individuals coming in just saying, uh, I'm, "I'm making a five-year plan or ten-year right. plan for my farm"? Uh, what can you tell me? Um, there's been some of that, but I think most of that actually goes through either extension right now because our extension in, in Vermont is so strong, and so there's um, there's there's more sort of liaison that way. Um, so I would I would tend to get more questions from from extension um, agents asking about X Y and Z. Um, so there's that piece. The other piece that that also involved in is the. Um, the resiliency work that Ernesto Mendez is, is working on. And so he, he, when he does outreach, uh, the team does outreach to the farmers around the state, that's when some of that request for climate information comes in, but not directly to me. So it's, it's more in, in partnership with um, existing frameworks. And hence buffered. Buffered in. Yeah, I, I don't know if buffered. Um, I think part of what um, occurs is that people don't know that I exist. And so I still get comments. I didn't know we had a state climatologist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's it's not so much buffering as not knowing where to go for, for some of this. Okay. Not even the ski industry. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, it's said climate does not equal climate change. Right. right your last thing. Yes. But has. I want to hear your perspective on that, and a question is, well, has all the attention to climate change actually elevated um, the role of state climatologists? So the reason why I put climate to not equal to climate change and need to sort of shift that paradigm is because when you think about climate, um, and you think about the totality, totality of it, and you think of it from a systems perspective, and, and you, you look at not just what the atmosphere is doing, but also how that influences the land surface and vice versa. Um, there are elements of thinking about climate with a capital C that are not necessarily related to um, how pieces of it are changing. Right. Right. So it's it's. I totally understand that. Right. But I'm and so, but is that a problem? 
or is it it's, it's is not it a climate change become an opportunity? Right. That? So it's it's not so much a problem. What it what it becomes is um, a sort of framing and a sort of understanding, because if you think about understanding climate change, and you know you think about it from the process level, the impacts level, is the um, strategies level. <coughs> um, even, even there, if I did a poll in this room here, um, some people might be thinking more about impact, some people might be thinking more about strategies, some people might be thinking about greenhouse gas emissions. So even within climate change, which piece of it you're talking about is, is one thing. So when, when you think about that and you think about um, even talking about other pieces of, of the climate system that are, that are not doing change, but you're, you're thinking about, I don't know, let me see. If I look at it from a historical perspective, just from understanding why we have maple sugar doing what we do, right? And not, not, and then that would be sort of like here, and then you can talk about how is that changing. So that just fundamental process, understanding peace. Um, if, if you equate the two, you're not getting full understanding of what it is you're talking about. And so sometimes when people say they're doing climate, they actually mean they're doing climate change. And so just being crystal clear on which you're doing, it's not that one's wrong and the other one's right, it's just a clarity perspective. Mm -hmm. Because um, then it comes back to the whole climate literacy piece that I'm interested in, so that the um, students coming up the rank, if they're not confusing climate and climate change and, and, and weather and everything all kind of mixed into one, then they'd be less, less confused when they actually get to you know, the level of how you work with stuff mm -hmm. and how you understand it and, and are you um, helping with adaptive strategies or are you helping with mitigate strategies, right? So, it's process-based. Does that, does that? Yeah. Okay. We're at time, so let me thank Leslie and if anyone else.